If you're a founder, you know that fundraising is a big part of the job. What you might not know is that Carta is there to help. Carta's new fundraising suite provides startups of all stages the best tools and support to easily issue safes, accurately forecast solution, and quickly close funding rounds. Save time, money, and make your next round your best yet. To learn more or to get started, go to carta.com forward slash fundraise. That's carta.com forward slash fundraise. Welcome to Inks for Starters with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, a serial entrepreneur myself and founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm that backs fearless founders who are solving some of the biggest challenges facing humanity. Now in our sixth season, we sit down each week with one of the best founders on the planet to hear their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Let's dive right in. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Von Tobel. And this week, I'm excited for you to meet Dr. Trevor Martin, co-founder and CEO of Mammoth Biosciences, the company on a mission to enable the next generation of CRISPR-based synthetic biology products across therapeutics and diagnostics. Mammoth was founded in 2017, and the company's work includes a novel class of affordable, effective, and rapid CRISPR-enabled molecular diagnostics that allow individuals worldwide to better understand their health and a novel family of CRISPR-Cas14 proteins that can enable in vivo editing. Trevor earned his BA from Princeton University and his PhD in biology from Stanford. He is the featured healthcare honoree on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, is on Fortune's 40 under 40 list, and is a malaria no more 10 to N innovator. And with that, let's welcome Trevor. Trevor, first of all, so excited to have you on today to talk about the future of biology and everything that's happening. But first, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's start with first things first. What is mammoth bioscience in your own words? Yeah, the really exciting thing about Mammoth is that it's building on this idea that now we can actually modify the code of life, so DNA and RNA, using this technology called CRISPR. So you can think of CRISPR as kind of a tiny molecular machine that allows you to go in and actually make a change to things like DNA. And you can think of DNA as like a giant Word document. So it's billions of letters and like any Word document, there might be misspellings or there might be places where you want to add a paragraph or remove a sentence or italicize something or bold it. You can really abuse this metaphor. But the basic idea is that, especially when it comes to disease, there might be errors in that document that you want to correct. And that would be a way of actually curing the disease rather than just treating it. Aside from this idea of modifying DNA and RNA, This idea of curing disease rather than just treating it is kind of a sea change in how we can hopefully think about healthcare. So CRISPR is the fundamental technology that we use at Mammoth, and it comes out of one of my co-founders, Jennifer Doudna, her lab, and she actually won the Nobel Prize for developing this technology. And my other co-founders, Janice and Lucas, uh, worked with Jennifer at Berkeley helping to develop these technologies. And now at Mammoth, we're continuing to build them and also commercializing them for a variety of uses, but mostly focused on this idea of permanent cures for disease. So you earned your BA from Princeton, your PhD in biology from Stanford, quite literally an expert on CRISPR. For those of us that maybe don't have nearly the knowledge base that you do, can you quickly give us a Cliff's Notes version of what CRISPR is and why you jumped on the opportunity to build Mammoth using CRISPR's potential? Yeah, so CRISPR is literally a physical thing. It's a protein. So uh, again, it's this kind of protein that is a tiny molecular machine that has two core functionalities. The first one is that it's programmable. And this is one of the big things that it's kind of a sea change in biology. Because when you learn biology growing up, including myself, it's kind of taught as this very messy and intractable and difficult thing to kind of interact with relative to, say, computers, which you put in an input and you get like an expected output. And technology like CRISPR is part of this wave of kind of synthetic biology and engineering biology. And CRISPR is maybe the best manifestation of this idea that we can actually program biology into a very similar way that we can program computers. And that's a very powerful concept because if we can program biology, we can start to think about how do we cure disease? How do we maybe make materials using biology? How do we build new types of diagnostics? And I think in general, that idea of programmability is really what's allowed CRISPR to take off in the way that it has, because it's something that can be very easily reprogrammed to go from you know, one location in the genome to the other, whereas with previous technologies, it would take you know, a whole PhD or just tons of trial and error to do these types of things that are actually quite facile with CRISPR. And then the second thing is that 
it's a programmable platform that allows you to send a protein to anywhere in the genome. So you program it to go to a different spot in the genome. So maybe it goes to gene A for one disease, gene B for another disease. Maybe it goes to gene C to edit something you want to do for biomanufacturing, goes to gene D for a diagnostic you want to build. Um, and that's a very powerful concept. You can send molecular machinery to any place in the genome to do whatever you want. And the nice thing is that CRISPR also kind of comes for free with its own molecular scissors that can be used to do a very simple form of genetic editing that can do things like cure disease. So you have this programmable platform, you can send it to anywhere in the genome. And when it's at that location in the genome, even just with its kind of basic functionality, it can actually cut the DNA and uh, knock out a gene. That's probably the simplest way of, for example, curing a disease is there's some gene that you don't want to express. So you clip it and that knocks it out. And that means you kind of deleted it from the uh, Word document. And that for many diseases can be potentially curative. So it's a really powerful kind of programmable platform that can be adapted in many different ways. What does that look like in practice? Does that look like a patient asleep on a table while scientists do something? Does that look like an injection? What does that look like in practice? That's a really great question. And I think it can take many different forms. There's actually now, very excitingly, an approved therapy in the U.S. that uses CRISPR to actually cause a break in the DNA to help with a disease called sickle cell disease uh, and actually beta thalassemia. This is what's called an ex vivo therapy. So this is a blood-based disorder. So in sickle cell, the blood cells are misshapen, and that means that they can't carry oxygen in the same way. And through a very clever process, you can actually make a cut and delete something, and that can actually allow a different copy of the gene that has the correct morphology to take over, and that can help patients with this disease. And for that, you actually take the blood out of the body, you make the edits to cells, and then you put the cells back into the body. Um, so the editing is taking place outside of the body, and then you're kind of putting it back in. And this is broader kind of field ex vivo editing of things like you know cell therapy. And it's not low-hanging fruit. It's also very difficult, but it's maybe the easier version of doing things like CRISPR editing because you can do the edits outside of the cell where we can manipulate cells in various ways. At Mammoth, what we're focused on actually is how do we bring that into the body, what we call in vivo. Because you can imagine for many diseases, you can't do that, right? Like blood is kind of a special case where you can take things out, put things in relatively facile. So it would be awesome if you could actually just have the patient come into the doctor's office, get an IV, some sort of, you know, just systemic injection, have the CRISPR system go to the right cells, do the right type of edit, and then the patient would be potentially cured. Now, this is a much more difficult problem, right? Because now In addition to doing the edit, you need to somehow get the machinery, the CRISPR system, in the right cells. And that's called the delivery problem. And that's a huge area of work that's going on right now. And that's one of the areas at Mammoth where because we have very, very tiny versions of CRISPR, like ultra tiny versions, we can actually fit better in a lot of different delivery methods. And that's kind of our dream at Mammoth. And that's where we've been innovating on the CRISPR side, for example, with these really tiny CRISPR systems to try and make that in vivo type of editing much more tractable. Tell us a little bit about your go-to-market at Mammoth. You partnered with leading pharma companies, including a billion-dollar deal with Bayer. How do you fit into the larger medical ecosystem, and how do they view Mammoth? Yeah, so in biotech, it's uh, very common to work with larger pharma and biotech companies to help commercialize products. At Mammoth, though, We are building a long-term biotech company. So in addition to working with partners, which are very useful, we also have what we call a wholly owned pipeline. So these are products that we will bring end to end ourselves. So our our first program in that area is for a disease called FCS. It's for patients that have very high triglycerides. And there's this one gene where if you knock it out, you can lower the triglyceride levels of these patients. So this is a program that we will take all the way from research through to commercialization and marketing ourselves. And that's a very expensive journey. In addition, we're very fortunate to work with really awesome partners like Bayer, Vertex, and we recently announced our newest partnership with Regeneron to both combine technologies to have a higher probability of success. So for example, with Regeneron, combining our CRISPR technologies with uh, innovation they've been doing on the delivery side, for example, with AAVs, So we can hopefully uh, tackle uh, different in vivo therapies in ways we couldn't otherwise. And then, of course, you know, combining expertise in terms of CRISPR, in terms of like commercialization, disease area expertise, 
so that by working together, hopefully you can get a drug with more likelihood of success, maybe even faster to market, where usually a typical way these deals are structured is that the large company kind of pays the emerging biotech like us some sort of access fee. And that could be you know, tens of millions to more dollars up front. And then there's some sort of uh, economics on the back end. And that could either be like a royalty to the emerging biotech or, for example, uh, in our deal with Regeneron, there can be co-funding and co-sharing of the profits. So there can be like even up to equal split, depending on how things are structured. So I think in terms of kind of how biotechs are built and commercialized, there's you know as many different models as there are <laughs> companies in the space. But I think One of the things that makes us excited at Mammoth is that we do see CRISPR as this true what we call platform. And that's a bit different than a lot of other things in biotech. Often when you build a drug, it's kind of just as hard to build the second drug after that. If you're doing something like in a small molecule, it's you maybe have a really awesome uh, initial therapy that you've built, but that doesn't mean you're going to be any faster, more effective at building the second or third or fourth one. But with CRISPR, because of that programmability, because you can actually just make small tweaks to it to go from disease A to disease B to disease C. The hope and the dream, and I think the reality, is that the second, third, and fourth therapy will be much faster to be developed than the first. And it'll just have this flywheel that you often see in other industries, but biotech hasn't had as much of. And that's how you build a long-term biotech. And it's building long-term biotech is unfortunately very rare in the industry, in all honesty, because usually companies do kind of, you know, sell to pharma or something, because that's what makes sense. Like, you're going to have to restart everything to build the second drug. But when you have a technology like CRISPR that is a platform and can be reprogrammed, uh, you have this opportunity to actually build the next great biotech company and actually have not just one drug, not just two drugs, but 10 dozens of drugs over time, both wholly owned and with partners. And working with partners, especially when you're an emerging company, is a really great way of kind of de-risking the whole process. Trevor, I want to talk a little bit about, you've said many times publicly, you are not in any capacity taking a short-term view when it comes to building out Mammoth. How do you think about the next few chapters of your business? What do you see clearly that you are going to want to evolve towards? Yeah, I think because we have that long-term view, we have to balance a couple things. And I think the most important balance that we have to find as a company, I think, honestly, this is what differentiates companies that do become lasting companies, biotech or otherwise, versus companies that maybe are very successful, and there's nothing wrong with that, but don't have that second, third, or fourth kind of act, is finding the right balance of product and go to market by any other term and commercialization and building your first set of drugs and research. And it's very easy when you know, you're seeing success and you're actually driving your first drugs to the clinic to appropriately be like, all right, okay, we're you know, fully focused on that maybe even ending research, and we're driving to the clinic, and that's the whole ballgame now. Or I've seen companies make the other mistake, which is they spend too much time in research, and they never focus enough on going to market. That's usually a bigger problem in low interest rate environment, but it definitely happens as well. And I think the mark of a company that lasts is finding that balance. And it's probably changing all the time, and it's probably the most difficult thing, and there's no right answer. But at Mammoth, we invest very heavily in research and will continue to, especially in the space of CRISPR that's moving incredibly fast. You actually stay at the forefront, but we need to invest equally and increasingly in development and driving drugs to the clinic. And that's a really tricky balance for any company to get right. And I think that is the primary determinant, though, of what kind of company you end up building at the end of the day. When you think of all of the possible use cases for CRISPR over the next decade, What are the ones that you see that are most exciting to you? Yeah, so obviously I'm biased, but I think this idea of moving healthcare from like treating disease to curing disease is just a complete sea change in many levels of just how we think about healthcare overall. And it even affects other parts of the healthcare system. Like how do we pay for these things, right? Because now instead of the patient being on various drugs and, you know, having to come into the hospital for decades of the rest of their life, maybe you have like a one-time treatment. There's many treatments on the market now that are millions of dollars, but that saves the healthcare system tens of millions of dollars potentially. But people change employers, their healthcare insurance might change. So you have to think about like, what are the payment models in this regime? So I think that's like an interesting knock-on effect of the technology advancing. And I think in terms of this idea of where CRISPR is headed, I think primarily these permanent cures require going in vivo. So it's like, how do we actually get to all these different cells in the body effectively and safely? That's a really tough problem. 
so that's an area where at Mammoth, we're very excited, not just over the next like five or 10 years, but I mean, there's so many genetic diseases, you could spend the next 50 years at least tackling these. And I hope that we live in a world 50 years from now where there's just no genetic disease. Like, I, I think that's very possible. What a beautiful thing to hear that that's within our lifetime, something that you feel like you can see. One thing I really admire that you've said in the past is you said, well, software is eating the world. That's only the appetizer. And you think the next decade is centered on biology. What do you see ahead as you think about your own predictions? What do you see that's coming? Yeah, I think it's part of this broader trend of like, how do we move from shifting bits around to shifting atoms around? Um, that's a much harder problem often. And I think some of the atoms we care about the most are the ones in our own body and, you know, animals and plants and just life in general. Obviously, that's very personal to us. So I think when it comes to kind of the impact of being able to programmatically interact with biology and actually change the code of life, uh, healthcare is the obvious one. And we spend ever increasing percentage of our GDP on healthcare. And I think the technologies like CRISPR and this idea of kind of moving to things like permanent cures can hopefully have a big impact, not just on quality of people's lives and prevalence of disease, but also help us manage costs. A healthcare system is built a lot around kind of managing disease to move more towards not even just treating, but even curing disease. And beyond that, I think biology touches every aspect of our life, right? Beyond healthcare, obviously, the food we eat, the world we live in, climate change, um, these are all things where with innovations in biology, I do firmly believe that we can make technological progress towards solving these. So in agriculture, how do we feed the next 8 billion people, right? In climate change, how do we make sure that either life is resilient to climate change or how do we stop our reverse climate change by co-opting biology in various ways? And if we want to even start thinking about how do we live longer and healthier lives so that we can be more productive? How do we go beyond the earth and live on other planets? That's going to require a ton of innovation in biology. I think all of these things really require us to think very critically about the atoms around us and not just the bits. And I think that's the spirit of the statement is uh, where we're going to see massive innovation, I think, over the next 10, you know, 100 years is applying many of these learnings from both building and scaling companies on the software side and having technologies allow us to increasingly have platforms on the uh, atoms and specifically biology side. I love that so much. And it's such a hopeful and exciting view of where the world is headed. We'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Alexa here. Not only do I get the opportunity to speak with all types of founders on For Starters, but I'm a repeat founder myself. We all know how vital fundraising is to a startup. Carta knows this too. That's why they had founders in mind when they created their fundraising suite, providing tools and support to take the friction out of fundraising. They save founders time and money, allowing you to focus on your goals, not the admin work needed to close around. From simply issuing safes to quickly receiving funds, Carta Fundraising Suite helps their cap table customers raise a better fundraising round. To learn more or to get started, go to carta.com forward slash fundraise. That's carta.com forward slash fundraise. Trevor, let's transition to you growing up. You grew up in Georgia. I always like to say, what's one thing in your childhood that like almost in a straight line, you can go back and like draw it to today as an absolutely booming, successful entrepreneur is there something you attribute to your childhood that you think helped you get here? Oh, interesting. I think curiosity mainly. And I was very fortunate to be in an environment that like encouraged that. But yeah, not necessarily being curious about the right things, but just being curious about things, I think is a very powerful concept. And like I think that serves has served me well anyway, like throughout my life is just being interested in asking questions and learning more about things and taking the initiative to just kind of jump into new areas. I think that is something you can have at any age. And I think it's something that I at least try and preserve. You had an interesting path to studying biology. What was it that attracted you to the field while you were at Princeton? And then obviously went and did your PhD at Stanford. But what do you think attracted you to decide to now devote what seems like the rest of your career in this category? Yeah, it definitely wasn't a straight line. When I was growing up in Georgia, I was actually probably most interested in history, I have to be honest. I mean, I love science, but I always thought I'd be like a historian. <laughs> it's a left turn there. I'm like, what, Trevor? 
Yeah. And I, yeah, I listened to too much NPR as a kid. That's why I don't have the Georgia accent either. So just, you know, a lot of all things considered and stuff like that. So I was really interested in like history and politics and just kind of reading as much as I could on that end. And when I came to college, I kind of on a whim, going back to this curiosity and just kind of jumping into things, took this program there called Integrated Science. And it was a newer program set up by a bunch of really awesome luminary scientists uh, who are teaching at Princeton, including uh, uh, David Botstein and others, who had this, at the time, very radical idea that we should be encouraging people that love physics and math and computer science to be biologists. That, at the time, was like a pretty new notion. Now you have to like stop physicists from thinking they know too much about biology, but especially then for an undergrad course, especially that was like a very radical notion. So I kind of took that class honestly on a whim and then fell in love with this idea of like, wait, like when I was taught biology was kind of like stamp collecting like parts of the plant. Like, honestly, I didn't find it that interesting, but that was just ignorance. Now I'm being taught biology as it really can be, which is an engineering discipline, a discipline where you can learn uh, laws of nature and make predictions just the same way you do in physics or chemistry. And as it turns out, it's even more interesting because it's really hard and there's just a ton of unknown inputs. So you have to really think very carefully about your models and your assumptions. And there's just a ton of room for massive progress to be made. So I fell in love with that kind of way of thinking about biology in undergrad, along with pretty much everyone else in that program. We all fell in love with it so much that we went to graduate school, mostly studying things like computational biology or engineering biology. And I think that that's what really resonated with me is that it's not stamp collecting. It's not parts of the plant. It's like you can really learn fundamental laws of nature just like any other discipline. There's this great concept of PhDs becoming founders, and there's also many misconceptions in that. Can you talk a little bit about what you think helped you in your PhD become the founder that you are and talk just a little bit about what about that process, that trend towards PhD to becoming a founder? What do you think the PhD taught you that has made you a better entrepreneur? I think people vastly underestimate how much a PhD can help you in many aspects of life, but especially (laughs) a startup. That being said, I think no one should do a PhD in order to do a startup. A PhD is a very long and grueling process. And the opportunity cost is probably way higher than is necessary. Uh, Because, you know, five, six, seven years to do this, not earning much money during that time as well. But if you happen to have loved doing research and do a PhD, I think you're incredibly well set up to go down the startup path if that's what you choose to do. And I think the primary reason is because in a good PhD, it's all about tackling the unknown. There's no answer in the back of the textbook. You're getting no's from your results constantly. There's a huge amount of grit and resilience, I think, to grind it out. And there's no right answer. There's no even necessarily clear guideline on when you're going to graduate. That being said, there are many things a PhD absolutely does not prepare. Maybe reverse of that. It maybe makes you worse in some ways at certain aspects of a startup. I think chief among them would be like people management. And I think somewhere in the middle, some programs... I think to their credit, like try and do more of this, but like, how do you pitch your research? How do you like present science? I think programs are maybe trying a little bit more on that front, but it definitely doesn't prepare you for like pitching a startup or something in any formal sense. But I think the area where it's probably weakest is definitely on how do you manage a team? How do you recruit people to your vision? So those those are the pluses and the minuses. And I think especially in deep tech areas like biotech, it can be a really great jumping off point for a startup also because you really do have deep knowledge, understanding, curiosity, passion for a very specific area. The way I've seen this go right and wrong is that if that area happens to have real commercial potential and actually can be a startup, great, like perfect. But I think people too often are like, this is my thesis, this is my PhD, I have to do a startup on this. But there's just maybe it's too early, maybe it's just not the right technology or whatever. There could be a million reasons, but it's just not the right idea for a startup. But they're like, well, this is my PhD. Like, I can't do anything else. Like, I worked five years, so I got to do this. And I think that's a common mental trap as well. And I think that's another area where PhDs are very well set up, but I think often can get a little mistracked in terms of maybe not understanding the full breadth of like what they could do. Trevor, it was in your answer, so I want to pull it out. You have this quote that I love, which is, let others say no to you. 
You don't have to say it to yourself. Tell us what you mean by that. I mean, I just speak for myself. I don't know about others, but growing up, especially, I probably would say no to myself an order of magnitude more often than other people would say no to me, like quite literally, right? Because no one likes rejection. So you always are like, okay, is this person going to say yes or no, this thing or that thing? And if you think it's no, you just don't ask. People actually, I think, handicap themselves by not wanting to get too many no's. And it's very rational. It's like, you know, emotionally tough, especially early on to have people turn you down for things. But I think it's like a huge life hack to just care less about that. And I think you'll be surprised that often you won't get a no, (laughs) which is kind of shocking. And it's easy to say, oh, we'll just do it. I think there's like a lot of emotional barriers often for people, either known or unknown to this. But it's very, very true that if you just try for things or just, you know, show up or like ask or, you know, put your hat into the ring, you'll be shocked at how often you're wrong about your prediction. And also you'll be shocked at like how beneficial that is, even if you get a no, that there's no pain, it's fine, like you can move on. And if anything, you've probably learned something that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. So I think that is one of the number one things people can do to just kind of transform the direction that they're taking is just don't self-handicap. Yeah. I really love that, Trevor. I like that so much, which is like, let others say no. Mm-hmm. Don't say no to yourself. And like pre get rid of that handicap. I just think it's such a great, really smart point. And I'm so glad that you've said it. Yeah. And I think the next level of it, which is even trickier And I have to like work on this well constantly. I think sometimes people take it. It's like, yeah, exactly. Like just don't care like or whatever. I think the most powerful version of it though is like still understand why people are saying, oh, this person's really smart. They probably have a reason why they're saying no, but don't over index on it. Just because someone's smart doesn't mean they're right. But try and learn from it, respect the no, be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, why is this person saying that? Do I agree or disagree? Oh shit, maybe I agree. I need to like figure out, or I disagree and this is why. And just be very like considerate about it. Trevor, I want to transition because I love it. You've said before that the name Mammoth, what you named your business, actually is a reference to the ambition that you have mm-hmm. for the scale of this business. First, I just want to take a moment. Not everyone is born that ambitious. Where does that ambition come from to build a generational company that changes, honestly, healthcare as we know it for all of us, for the whole planet? But like, where did that ambition come from? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe youthful naivete. But one thing I do really believe is that doing anything is hard. Like small dreams, big dreams, middling dreams. Everything's hard to actually like bring into being, whether that's like a school project or that's building a company. I don't know. Like everything's takes a lot of work and there'll be like twists and turns. So if you're gonna especially build a company, why waste your time? doing something small potatoes, if it's going to be 90% as hard as trying to build something generational that is going to make a huge impact on people in the world. And so I think it very much stems from like this, I guess, core idea that if you're going to spend your time on earth doing things, you might as well just do the maximal possible thing you can do. And if you're not, you should always be trying to pivot into the maximal possible thing you should do. I just agree with you so much. Like all businesses are really hard and stressful, so you may as well go after the big one. I want to move to the quick fire round. I'm going to ask a question. Just first thing that comes to your mind, there's no right answer. What's one thing you wish you knew before you started? I think in academia, often business is painted as kind of this bad guy or like the dark side or something. But at least in Silicon Valley, and I'm sure other areas as well, there's a gigantic ecosystem that like wants, especially deep tech startups to succeed because they're very impactful, very directly on the world in a very positive way. And I don't think I fully appreciated that, that there are just tons of people that want to help even with no financial remuneration or things. Yeah. If you have an interview question that you really like to ask whether somebody should come work at Mammoth, what's a question you like to ask to get to the core of who somebody is? I think one for me that I found has actually engendered the most interesting discussions and actually, I think, shed the most light on kind of who someone is, is often very simple, which is just like, what are you hoping to learn in this role? And that can be taken a lot of different directions, but I find that often creates some of the most interesting conversations. What is the biggest pinch me moment that you've had to date at Mammoth? I mean, there's a lot. I think two that come to mind are one, when we got the emergency 
use authorization on the diagnostic side during the pandemic. That was like an incredible effort by the team to get that across the line very quickly. I mean, a real testament to both the team and the technology itself as well. And then more recently, getting our first non-human primate data on the therapeutic side, which is you know a step closer to the clinic. And then hopefully, you know, when we get our first patients, that'll be, I think, the ultimate moment. So. That's awesome. Last question. One category that you're interested in that has nothing to do with mammoth that you're excited about? I would say maybe it's like adjacent, but I think in general, how can we leverage new machine learning, AI, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> former statisticians. So I never know what the line is between machine learning and AI, but how do we leverage that to, I guess, address one of the big kind of future problems we were talking about earlier, which is like, how do we actually understand biology? Like we're getting better and better at engineering it, which is super cool and critical to moving forward. But how do we get way better at understanding through like new statistical techniques or like new data sets that are collected or whatever it is, some combination of the above, understanding like the actual causative underlying biology. Like this gene does this, this gene does this, they interact in this way like eventually modeling completely in silico, like a cell or even a whole body, that will just be the other half of the puzzle eventually. And I think we have a long way to go there, but I think obviously there's a ton of excitement around various machine learning and AI techniques. And I hope that that does advance the biological side as well. I love that. Trevor, first of all, this has been such a joy. Um, you are fascinating. And I am so grateful, sincerely, that you are building Mammoth for the rest of us. Thank you so much for just this incredible pursuit of your life's work. It's just absolutely awe-smacking. Um, and for everybody out there, if you want to learn more, please head to mammoth.bio to learn more about what Trevor is up to. And you can join us next week for a new episode of For Starters with Alexa Von Tobel. Trevor, thank you so much. We are rooting for you. Thanks for having me on.